Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a Sanctuary for you. Let's sing it one more time. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Father God, Lord, I thank you for this afternoon, Lord. I thank you for the time that I've had with you this afternoon. Lord, I thank you for the sweet Holy Spirit that you sent. After you resurrected into heaven and in Acts chapter 2, Lord, you talk about the Spirit that's coming and you sent it as a mighty rushing wind, Lord, that we enjoy your presence living inside of us. Lord, I thank you for the guidance and the wisdom uh, that comes with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you for the Word of God. Lord, I thank you for the cross, Lord. I thank you for the resurrection. And above all, Lord, I thank you for the resurrection power that lives deep inside of me and deep inside of every believer. Lord, everyone that calls on the name of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, everyone who proclaims you as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you have met us right where we are, Lord. That no one is forgotten, no depth is too deep that you can't reach and get them and yank them out of that pit of darkness. And Lord, set them into your glorious light. Lord, I praise you because you are holy. I praise you because you are righteous. I praise you because you are the one and only redeemer. You are the very reason that we walk. You are the very reason that we breathe. Lord, I thank you, Lord, because I feel you even now. I feel your sweet presence here, Lord. I thank you for the redeeming power, for the resurrection power that comes forth just because you rose out of that grave and defeated death. Lord, I praise you for each person who's here. I praise you, Lord, for what you have to say to them. Lord, not what I have to say, but what you have to say. May no word leave my mouth that is not of you tonight, Lord. I have nothing to boast in. I'm just, just, just a woman on this planet who does love you, Lord. And I thank you in Jesus' name. You may be seated. There's a song that says, I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing. Of the goodness of God. For all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. And every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. The next verse says, I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. 
You are close like no other. A few weeks ago, I was, no, it wasn't a few weeks ago. It was a few, it was maybe a month, month and a half ago. I was teaching my class about Lazarus and I'm going to reach, I'm going to read that in just a minute. But I was teaching my class and some of you who teach and some of you uh, that have the anointing to preach, this may happen to you, that may not, I, I don't know. But I was just teaching from a book, I'm following a curriculum, but sometimes when I'm teaching and I'm just saying whatever it is that the lesson's about and I was talking about Lazarus and I was talking about Jesus standing in front of the tomb and Jesus calling Lazarus out of the grave and boy, I'm telling you, out of the blue, it wasn't summoned by me, it wasn't anything special that I said, but the Holy Spirit entered that room. I don't even know if my kids felt it. I don't even know if they know what it feels like. I'm sure they probably do because kids know a lot more than we give them credit for. But the Holy Spirit came in that room and I could feel it, JC, like something built up a fire inside of me. You know, you hear that. It's like a fire shut up in my bones. I could feel it. And I finished my last lesson and I sat down in my chair and I was like, man, Lord, what what, what was that? And, and as I was saying, I, I said the words, resurrection power. And I believe that the Lord began to work something in me right then uh, regarding the power that comes because he spent three days, nights, whatever you want to talk about in hell. Because he spent that time defeating the one who had reign on the earth. Because he did that because he saw me 2,000 something years later, Amanda Anderson, because he saw Tony all these years later and he said, you know what, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to defeat that old guy because I want Tony to walk in power that he's never known before. Because I want Amanda to know, a few weeks ago, Pastor was talking. I don't know how long it's been. But he was talking about healing. And uh, he was saying that, he, he, let, me, let me back up. Healing is a tender topic for me. Uh, because I, I know some people that are in chronic pain and it, it tears me up. I've prayed for them. I've laid hands on them. I've, I, I've done all of the, the, the things that you see in the scripture that, that you, you think that they should be healed. They, they should be healed, Randy. I, I don't understand. And so it's a tender topic because I've never seen anybody be healed instantly. I've never seen the sick be well instantly, Brother Ken. I've never had somebody come back to me a day later and say, today I'm well because you prayed. Yes, I I haven't seen it. And when pastor sat that night and he said, I saw when I was a child and they did this and they did that, tears welled up in my eyes because in some ways I'm jealous. Why, God? Why can't I pray for Randy and he be healed? Why can't I pray for Miss Day? I don't understand. Why is it happening for some? And why have some seen it? And I've never seen it. I I don't, I don't, I don't understand. Is it, is it something that I'm doing wrong? Is it, is it something that I haven't done? Is it, what, what am I missing And I, I went to bed that night a, a bit just disheartened, not because Chet said anything wrong, but just because there are people who see it. And it's not that I even uh, have prayed for the gift of healing. I just want to pray and I want to see the resurrection power that came in my room that day just because I said the word. Since then, 
to now because that night I, I posed that question to the Lord again. What, what, what's wrong? What's, what's the difference? You know, I, did, I didn't see those things as a kid like he did. I went to church, but it just wasn't like that. I just didn't have that experience. I haven't ever had that experience. Eric has had that experience. As a matter of fact, in the days following that, there was at least twice that I prayed for something, then Eric prayed for something. And do you know whose answer came? It wasn't mine. And I even looked at him and I said, I don't think I'm the one that needs to be praying here. I think you're the one that needs to be praying here. And part of that, I was being sincere. And part of that, I was being a little bit like, do you hear me, Lord? <laughs> do you hear what I just said? Because I meant for you to hear that. Because I didn't understand. And after I said that to him, the Lord reminded me of a night that I was at my mom's house. And there was a lady there, and she's on her deathbed right now. But I think she probably would have been dead that night. Um, she was sitting in my mom's chair, and she looked like she was dying, Mark. She looked really bad, and Eric wasn't even there. I, I think he was out of town, or I don't even know where he was. And I went to her when we were done, and she's like, Mandy, I, I need you to help me get up. And so I got her up, and she couldn't stand hardly. I don't even know what she was doing there trying to play games and stuff, but she couldn't stand, and I got her up, and she said, please pray, and I prayed. And she was able to walk to the bathroom, and she was able, and uh, about a week later, I'm pretty sure she had a heart attack there while we were standing there that night. And the Lord's like, see, you did pray. You just didn't even realize the effect of your prayers. Because I, I, I'm almost certain she would have died. And she's an older lady. She's not. She's in her 70s, and, and she loves the Lord. And she felt better the next day. And so the Lord has done little things like that since then to encourage me. But still, I still... I want the power that he gave because of the cross and resurrection. I want to see it, Brother Ken, working in the body of Christ. I want my kids to see it. I want my kids to know what that is. I don't want it to just be words. I want them to feel it. I want them to proclaim it. I want them to know that Jesus is the absolute truth, that this Bible is the absolute truth. I want them to walk in the power and authority of Jesus Christ, Tony. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to start uh, with this verse tonight when I was getting ready and I was writing down where I wanted to go. And uh, there's been a couple of songs, one being that uh, the goodness of God, but there's another one called uh, Rattling about uh, dry bones that has just really, really ministered to me. So tonight when I was writing things down that I wanted to make sure that I talked about, I wanted to write down Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, but I was listening to that rattling song because that's how I kind of work when I'm studying and when I'm doing. I was listening to that rattling song, so I'm not paying attention to what I'm writing down. So I write Ezekiel 36, 36. And a second later, I look down, and I'm like, why in the world did I write Ezekiel 36, 36? And then I read Ezekiel 36, 36, and it says this, Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and have planted 
what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Now, I want to read you a little history of Ezekiel because that's right at the end or close to the end of chapter 36. So I want to read you a little historical context of chapter 37. Uh, it's a vision that Ezekiel had, um, and this vision dates to the period of Israel's history known as the Babylonian exile. I'm pretty sure this goes back to uh, when he told them, hey, you're going to be there for 70 years. You know, get just go ahead, marry, have kids, get settled in. You're, you're going to be there for a little while. In 597 BCE, the armies of Babylon forced the capitulation of the rebellious city of Jerusalem and deported the Judean king and many Judean leaders to Babylon. That's from 2 Kings chapter 24, verses 10 through 16. Ten years later, in 587-6 BCE, after Jerusalem had rebelled again, the Babylonians razed, which means destroyed, um, R-A-Z-E-D, Jerusalem and its temple and deported the second wave of Judean leaders. Among the first wave of deported was the young Ezekiel, whom God later called into Babylon in the office of a prophet. For those deportees forced to live in Babylon, the future seemed a black hole in which people were destined to appear. I'm going to tell you right now, if you look amongst our young people, if you look amongst the teenagers, the 20-somethings, and even the 30-somethings, it looks like a black hole in which they disappear. And part of the reason, well, I don't even, I can't even tell you what the reasons are because I would be speaking amiss. I can only tell you what I think they are. Part of the reason is, is that we either haven't been submitted, subjected, died enough on the cross that they have not seen the Christ that they need to see. That it's usually on the hands of those who came before them, of the fathers and the mothers. A century and a half previously, many city, citizens of Judah's sister kingdom, Israel, had been similarly, similarly deported and had lost their identity and had faded into the mists of history, the so-called lost tribes of Israel. We are in danger. And this is not my message tonight. My message is a message of hope tonight. But we are in danger if we don't get on our knees of losing our children of losing these generations that are coming if we don't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ with the power and authority that came with the resurrection, we are in danger of losing them to that black hole that they're talking about right here. The exile was more than just a crisis of physical suffering and communal identity. It also necessitated a crisis of faith. The key symbols of Judean faith were Jerusalem, its temple, and its people. And the Davidic monarchy that had been theologically rational, rationality of the ancient world. Many exiled Judeans assumed that their deity... Goodness. Many Judeans assumed that their deity... The one true God had been defeated by a stronger deity from Babylon. If that doesn't make you want to stand up and shout the name of Jesus, oh my goodness, how much of the world do we see right now that thinks that our God has been defeated by some other God? And I stand here today to tell you that He has not been defeated. That there is no other God before Him. That those who worship other gods will not be with Him. There is no way to Him except through the cross of Jesus Christ. The people wondered if the Lord was truly Lord. 
and if he was truly faithful. Ezekiel chapter 37 says this, The hand of the Lord came upon me, this is Ezekiel talking, and brought me out of the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, and I feel like this is a question that he is posing to all of us who are believers, who have been commissioned to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Son, daughter, can these bones live? Can those 20-somethings live? Can those teenagers that won't even sing a song in chapel every week at our school, can their bones come alive? Can they live? So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, prophesy to those bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. When I teach creation to my little ones, I ask them, how did it come into being, JC? What happened that made those stars appear? What happened that caused those animals to be formed? What happened that separated the waters and created the, the seas and the skies? What happened, Tony? He spoke. The power of his word we see right here in the book of Ezekiel when he tells Ezekiel, prophesy to those dry bones, prophesy to those kids, prophesy to this coming generation and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will put sinews over you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then shall know, then you shall know that I am the Lord. There is coming a day when he is calling every one of us, those in this room and those outside this room, who have been put away in their closet praying and reading and study, there's coming a day that he's going to say, get up, prophesy, tell them that they're going to live. Tell them that I am the Lord. Tell them that I am all that they need and all that they will ever need, that I am the very reason that they were put on this earth. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone indeed. As I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy the breath to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on the slain that they may live. So I prophesied and he commanded as he commanded me. And the breath came into them and they lived and stood up on their feet an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. O oh, my people, and brought you up out of the graves. 
I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Turn to John chapter 11. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, in the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was, that Mary, it was the Mary that had anointed the Lord with the fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent him, saying, Behold, Lord, behold, um, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed there two more days in the place where he was. And then after he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. Are you going there again? Often, when the Lord puts something in my heart to say, such as the resurrection power, such as anything that I've ever said in front of people, in front of my kids, often the enemy comes to steal it, Brother Ken. Often, it is a mighty big fight before I get to right here because I got out of the truck tonight and said, I'm never doing this again. Lord, have mercy. I'm a nervous wreck. Are you going there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I might wake him up. And the disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, then he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, because sometimes he just has to break it on down for you. He just had to break it on down for him, Brother Ken. He just had to tell him, okay, look, he's dead. I'm not glad for your sakes, or I am glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. You see, he knew he, he wasn't even worried about Lazarus. He wasn't worried about the fact that Lazarus was actually going to be in that grave for four days. You know what he was worried about? He was worried about the men who were with him. And the fact that they hadn't yet realized exactly fully who he was. And he said, I'm glad for your sakes that I am not, I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. I'm going to skip on down to verse uh, 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard Jesus was coming, went out to meet him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Mary still isn't quite sure what he's talking about because she says, I know, Lord, he's going to rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I, I can picture Jesus standing in front of her and, he, and he's just looking and he's, and he's saying, I am the resurrection. It's not something that you've got to look forward to. I am standing in front of you. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die do you believe this man 
I feel like that's what he's, he's asking me today. He's saying, I am the resurrection, Amanda. Do you understand that I live inside of you? Do you understand that I am the life-giving force that's in you? Um, do you know where to go inside you and to, to bring that force to everybody else? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come. When she had said these things, she went her way secretly and called, her, called Mary, her sister, saying, Teacher has come, calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they went and saw, when they saw Mary, rose up quickly and went out to follow her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell down at his feet, at, at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and, Jew, and the Jews came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you lain him? Knowing even that he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. When he looked at his people, when he looked at Mary, when he looked at them weeping, he had compassion for them. Because what hurt them hurt him. They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, see how much he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay at it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you, did I not say that if you just believe, you would see the glory of God? And they took away that stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you will always hear me because of the people who are standing by. I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus. Come forth. And he who had died came out of that tomb, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face even wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said, Loose him and let him go. Many of the Jews who had come to Mary had seen the things that Jesus did and believed in him. It is time for us to walk in the authority and the power of Jesus Christ. It is time for us to call those things that are dead. And I'm not even talking just about people who are physically dead. He is the resurrection power of marriages. He is the resurrection power of those who are addicted and lost hope. He is the resurrection power that comes into any life that is destitute, that is hopeless, that is in a dark, dark pit. He is the resurrection power that pulls them from those things and sets them on the rock. If you will look at John chapter 20. I am going to read, I'm sorry, give me just a second. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have lain him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter 
they came to the tomb first and he stooping down and looking in saw the linen cloths lying there yet he did not go in then simon peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the linen cloths but folded together in a place by itself then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and he saw and believed for as of yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead and then the disciples went away again to their own homes but mary stood outside the tomb weeping and she wept as she stooped down and looked into the tomb and she saw angels in white sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of jesus had lain and they said to her woman why are you weeping she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have lain him. Now when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. She didn't know it was Jesus, and Jesus said, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, have you carried him away? Tell me where you have laid him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned to him and said, Rabbi, and Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but my brethren, and say to them, I am ascending to the Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. If you'll turn to Acts chapter 2. Verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven, a mighty rushing wind, and filled the whole house that they were sitting in. And then there appeared amongst them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Dry bones hear the word of the Lord. Because he told them when I'm gone, I'm going to send one who is greater. I'm going to send a spirit that's going to cause you to do things that haven't seen before. I'm going to send one who's going to live as a fire inside of you. I'm going to send a guide through the wilderness and the darkness. That valley of dry bones that we read about in Ezekiel, the Holy Spirit allows us, Brother Ken, to walk through dry bones. It allows us to call them out and say, breathe, breathe again, come, live again. Jesus is Lord. If you'll turn to Philippians chapter 3. Verse 8, this is Paul talking and he said, Yet indeed I count it all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. I want to stop right there for a second. Sometimes as we walk this walk, as we crawl on that cross and we die a daily death and we crucify everything that is in us and we, we take away everything that defines our human character and our human nature, Charlie, and we tell it, you've got to go. Not my will but the Father's be done. As we do that, we, we can say the same thing that Paul. You know what? It's all rubbish anyway. Brother Ken, it's all rubbish. Everything that I am, everything that I could be human carnally on this earth, it's rubbish. It's nothing. Except that the Christ in me be glorified. The loss of all things and count, it, count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him 
having not my own righteousness. Praise God. It is not my righteousness. I have nothing but filthy rags. Nothing this day. Nothing good. It's all yuck. It's all nasty. It's all dirty. Which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him. It is worth every death I die in the Spirit, that I may know Him and that I may know the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained it, or that I'm already perfected, but I press on and lay my hold of that which is Jesus Christ has also laid hold of me. That is my hope, Brother Ken. I ask the Lord, why, Lord? Why, Lord? And you know what he tells me right there? You have it. Keep praying. Keep speaking. Keep believing. Don't doubt what he says. Don't allow the enemy to say, like he told the disciples, hey, and the disciples telling Jesus, hey, they're going to kill you over there. Because you know what the enemy whispers in my ear? Hey, he's not going to use you like that. You might as well not be praying for people. He's going to use Eric. He's going to use Mark. He's going to use Chet and Ken. He's not going to use you that way. And what did Jesus say? Oh, hold on. Hold up. The same power that lives in all of them lives in me. And if I stop, what else is there? There's nothing. It's as dung. It's rubbish. Because if I stop, if I stop ministering the gospel, if I stop talking about Jesus, if I stop praying for the sick, laying hands on those who need it, if I stop, I'm just a carnal woman who has nothing else to gain. God forbid. God forbid, Charlie. You can't. Even when I get out of a truck and I say, I'm never doing this again. Brother Ken. <laughs> right? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for the resurrection power that comes because of all that you did on that cross and what you did three days later by raising from the dead. Lord, I thank you that we have a place with you. Lord, we have a place with you in heaven. Lord, that we are yours, that we can stand with you right now here on this earth. Stand knowing that your power, your Holy Spirit lives right here in us. Lord, may we realize the profoundness of that. And Lord, may it humble us to our knees. And thanks to you for all that you are and all that you give. In Jesus' name, amen.